All right. So this week we're going to talk about the intersection of um, manias and schizophrenia. When I was designing this series about a year ago, I chose the title Manias and Schizoaffective Disorder. We will cover, cover those um, briefly, but in the light of my current thinking, uh, I'm going to focus more on the, the neurobiology and the pharmacological evidence for etiological overlap, and we'll talk less, I mean, we'll just cover some, some basic things around the, the uh, specific diagnostic criteria of mania and schizoaffective disorder. So as part of why I'm interest, in, interested in this topic and why I chose to devote this section of time in the curriculum to these mood and psychosis overlap uh, relates to this uh, case from my, from my practice from many, many years ago. I, I met this young man, 19 years old, by every definition of schizophrenia, he was solidly in the category to uh, be called schizophrenia, to have schizophrenia. Um, in older criteria, he would have been said to have the paranoid subtype of schizophrenia. Um, I knew as well that he had a brother about a few years older who was, by all accounts, classically type 1 bipolar. Uh, by the time I got this young man, he'd, he'd failed two adequately dosed trials of antipsychotic medications, and I had the um, ignoble distinction of giving him his third type of antipsychotic medication, uh, which he proceeded to have no response to. Um, again, I was really clear that, I mean, I talked with the mom in, at length about his older brother, and there was no evidence of schizophrenia, uh, psychosis with this guy. He was a classic manic uh, individual with a lot of energy, decreased need for sleep, and um, grandiose ideas, and so forth. Uh, my patient had none of that. He slept regularly. He was uh, beset with paranoid ideation, and as I said, completely no evidence with which to diagnose him with anything other than schizophrenia. Um, and at a certain number of weeks into this non-helpful trial of yet another antipsychotic drug, um, as he was um, complaining with a great deal of, of um, distress that people in the hallways are reading his mind and talking about him behind his back, I just decided to offer him lithium, which he accepted. And about uh, four days, between four to seven days, he was uh, amazingly better and proceeded to get even further, um, even further better. So I'll, you know, we can talk about this when we finish the slides. Uh, what does this mean? What is the right diagnosis for this individual? Uh, we tend to think if it's something responsive lithium, we call that bipolar disorder, but there were no um, clinical grounds on which to diagnose him with bipolar disorder. Um, it's a conundrum which comes up, I think, in, in everybody's practice and certainly is described well in the literature. Um, the phenomenon of a lithium responsive uh, subset of individuals within schizophrenia was well known uh, to at least people in the research community in the 70s and 80s. A uh, number of papers were written in that epoch that were trying to, among other things, identify uh, biological markers that might predict lithium response. There was also a literature developed uh, trying to look at psychological testing. Um, is there a certain uh, MMPI profile that would predict lithium response? And the, the field was kind of inching toward perhaps a convergence of psychological and, and uh, biological markers for lithium response in schizophrenia. And then as I read the literature, it basically just stopped. I, if anybody happens to know the history um, of that. I would love to know the reason why. I can't see any um, any smoking gun, and nobody wrote a seminal paper that said that's all crap. Uh, it just sort of uh, went away in the in the middle eighties. Uh, but the point is that um, there was. Um, and probably still is a subtype of schizophrenia which responds very well to lithium. And according to some authors from that lithium heyday, uh, the response to lithium was said to be quite rapid, as was what I observed. So um, now comes just reviewing some things. Um, when we talk about 
a manic episode, the DSM actually has specific specific uh, criteria that have to be met before some mood episode is called mania. Uh, there has to be, as as we know, a, a period of markedly um, unusually abnormally elevated expansive irritable mood um, often goes along with high levels of energy. The duration is important because in this modern era, lots of people get diagnosed with bipolar disorder based upon manias that last an hour or a day. Um, but the DSM actually specifies that uh, to be called a manic episode, this, this period of marked elevation of mood and energy uh, needs to last for a week. And during this continuous period, um, there should be at least three or more of grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, et cetera. So that's a, that's a manic episode. And a manic episode then defines bipolar disorder. Uh, so there is, no polar, there is no bipolar diagnosis without that episode of mania. Um, I forgot to just put the caveat in that if somebody is hospitalized on account of a manic episode, um, it doesn't have to last seven days to meet the DSM definition. And then we come to a schizoaffective disorder, which is, um, I, I, ironically, uh, if you look at epidemiological studies, they'll say that schizoaffective disorder represents about 1% of the population. But if you look to hospital discharge diagnoses, it accounts for 10% or so of hospital discharge diagnoses. Uh, so, uh, and ironically, um, it, seems most, it seems most difficult to diagnose schizoaffective disorder in the hospital uh, because one has to ascertain that the psychotic symptoms of delusions or hallucinations persist in the absence of a mood episode. So, so typically in the hospitals, people will come in with a mixture of um, psychosis and um, and manic and mood episodes, typically manic manic symptoms. Um, I call it manicosis because then you can use the adjective manicotic, which sounds memorable. Um, but that's that's not the DSM. That's just Messamore talking. Um, but anyway, people will come into the hospital with this with this um, hybrid of psychosis and and mood episodes, uh, mood symptoms, and that would be you know one criteria for schizoaffective disorder. But after the episode is resolved, and specifically after the mood episode is resolved, then there has to be a persistence of psychosis. Um, and thirdly, this is um, the way it's currently conceived in DSM is that schizoaffective disorder is more of a mood disorder with. Uh, rather than a persistent psychosis with um, brief episodes of mood disturbance. Um, if there are any questions, we can discuss that as well um, at the end of the lecture. But that it's a point of, I think, a lot of confusion uh, amongst um, practitioners of all levels. So I thought I would just um, go over the current thinking. And, and also the current thinking, by the way, evolves. Um, schizoaffective disorder was first coined in the 50s, and it was... Uh, the what it described in those days is, is kind of different from how we operationalize it now. So coming back to the question, <clears throat> uh, the case that we talked about, um, the, the person that was clinically by DSM criteria, solidly earning a schizophrenia diagnosis, yet not responding to antipsychotic drugs, who did respond to the classic antimanic or bipolar drug lithium, um, raises the question, are these separate categories with separate causes, or is just uh, do these diseases um, have different different symptoms but um, have common underlying causes? So I would like to introduce you to this paper. In the announcement for this today's for today's session, I sent this link, uh, and I'll post the PDF on our website. Um, and the PDF will have the link hyperlinked. It's an open access paper. Uh, it's very interesting. It's a little bit dense in the, in the middle where they talk about the various genetic studies on candidate genes, uh, but it's a um, quite interesting read um, and worth, yeah, if you want to have your mind a little bit blown about the lack of solidity of our diagnosis, then go ahead and read that. So some, some key points from, from the paper, um, they, they outline in the, in the introduction that our current concept of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder as distinct d diseases having their own chapters in the DSM um, goes back more than 100 years um, and to the time of ML Kreplin. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention. Um, so we have this idea that we have these two different diseases, and that actually, the point I wanted to make is that um, the notion of two separate illnesses 
defines essentially all of research in psychiatry. Um, you're either studying schizophrenia or you're studying bipolar for genetics, for studying cause, for looking at treatments. Um, and the, the question is whether that um, distinction that we've made really holds up to biological reality. Uh, the paper discusses the Kreplinian dichotomy. Kreplinian is an adjective of the last name of this man, Emil Kreplin, uh, who was a German psychiatrist and, a, if you will, a pioneer in psychiatric classification. Uh, this is a photo from him in 1926. He coined the term dementia precox, which Bloiler, his contemporary, his Bloiler lived at the same time of Kreplin, but lived uh, was born later and died later. Um, Kreplin changed the name to schizophrenia. That's the name that stuck. Uh, but Kreplin uh, sort of solidified 19th century thought and said that there are two kinds of illnesses. There's an episodic illness, which is characterized by, by mood disturbances, and then there's a more persistent illness, which is characterized by uh, functional declines and uh, what we call psychotic experiences. And uh, that was, that distinction is what we've lived with ever since. Uh, but Kreplin himself um, nuanced his positions uh, from the beginning. Uh, when Kreplin described dementia precox, he said that there were um, nine clinical forms. So uh, we would recognize today things that maybe don't belong in one diagnostic category. Um, and then Kreplin himself started to later write that uh, maybe this classification scheme is not actually correct. And maybe the affective illnesses and the psychotic illnesses um, are merely like two sides of the same etiological coin. In other words, that you have a, the similar underlying pathophysiology, but how it's expressed, whether in terms of moods or in terms of psychosis, um, is dependent upon, uh, in Kreplin's view, personality factors, and I think modern authors would say personality and environmental factors. So um, seeds of doubt in this dichotomy were already present from almost the beginning. And the twin studies, for example, also um, reported in this paper, uh, just, just add to that uncertainty. So the paper uh, describes work by Slater and Shields showing that in identical twins, uh, if one twin had schizophrenia, the likelihood of the other having schizophrenia was about the same as the other twin having bipolar disorder. Um, and uh, in the original studies of twins, the, they set it up so that if there was a diagnosis of schizophrenia anywhere in a person's history, that would be the diagnosis the person got. So the schizophrenia took higher, higher place in the hierarchy of lifetime diagnosis. But uh, if you analyze those data, or if one analyzes those data, without that um, automatic kicking up of schizophrenia's hierarchy and um, allow equal, equal credibility to the possibility of a schizophrenia or bipolar diagnosis, um, then that genetic analysis leads to conclusions that say that there are some genes which are strongly and specifically associated with schizophrenia. There are some genes that strongly and specifically associate with bipolar, but there are many genes that actually um, appear to be uh, either way. Um, so one has those genes and they can predispose one to either of those two illnesses. Um, and finally, there's, um, in the context of, to illustrate that, they point out these Maudsley triplets, uh, genetically identical, a threesome genetically identical, um, two with schizophrenia, one with bipolar disorder. So clearly, um, the genetic information is saying that uh, genes don't determine destiny. Um, there, are, there are descriptions of each of these gene, genes, disbind in disc one NRG, um, and so forth uh, in the paper. Uh, the bottom line uh, to those um, data are, are this model in which certain genes can predispose one to schizophrenia, certain genes can predispose one to uh, mood disorder, but there's a lot of um, overlap in gene products. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, where genetics seem to be taking us. Um, I always say um, I love drugs because drugs tell the truth. Um, and I expand that by saying that, right, you know, in the field of psychiatry, everything that we believe about diagnosis is based upon things you can't really see. Um, subjective reports of inner experience um, or 
observations of behavior which are kind of ephemeral and um, nonspecific. So in a world where um, most of the diagnosis is kind of ephemeral and invisible, drugs are touchstones to physiological reality. So drugs interact with systems inside of a body and if they whatever changes they produce um, serve as a as a kind of interrogative or reporting function to the drug prescriber to let one know what's going on. So when somebody with a psychosis or with a mania gets better with a dopamine blocking drug, one can conclude that dopamine, excess dopamine signal was somehow relevant to the symptoms which caused that medicine to be prescribed. Uh, one can also conclude that if uh, one is given a drug like lamotrigine or lithium uh, and one gets better with the effect size of about 0.7 or 0.6, as shown in this table from the Corel review, also hyperlinked for your convenience, um, that the drug targets of lithium or lamotrigine are probably somehow relevant to the total psychopathology of schizophrenia. So um, the fact that some people with schizophrenia get better with some drugs which are prototypically seen as antimanic drugs, um, again, makes one think that um, the distinction is maybe not so clear as we were originally taught, um, which puts us in a bind because right now we don't have um, biomarkers. We can't, use, we can't do personality assessments. We can't even really that reliably look at clinical features um, to help us determine which person with schizophrenia is going to be, for example, a lithium responder. Uh, but clearly there's a need for developing those markers and one would hope that with the increasing level of evidence from genetic studies that this distinction is um, blurred, that we might wind up with gene biomarkers or physiological biomarkers or other kinds of tests which we might be able to use prospectively to predict medicine uh, responses. But right now, we have to just, I think, keep in mind that, um, that a person who's not getting better with a certain medication, with a certain antipsychotic medication, might get better with an anti-manic medication, um, and keep an open mind, I guess, about the, the distinction between these two disorders. So those are the